Welcome to the Virtual Frontier, the podcast about virtual teams created by Virtual Team. Disclaimer, all of our interviews are conducted virtually. I'm Daniel, your host, and I'm part of the team here at the Virtual Frontier. In this episode, we welcome David Burkes as our guest. Two years ago, I started to take my LinkedIn activities more seriously. And back then, I was looking for intelligent ways to do so. I do not recall exactly how I landed on the TEDx site and the talk, How to Hack Networking from David. Well, after watching the talk, I took the initiative and with less than 100 connections on LinkedIn, I reached out to David with a connect request. Even he is a best-selling author with more than 15,000 followers on LinkedIn alone, he walked his talk and accepted, and it felt great. I invited him over to our podcast, he agreed, but shortly after we lost contact. This could be the end of the story, and again, one more of those loose connections on social media. But it went a different way. Just a couple of months ago, we reconnected when I found out about his new upcoming book. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about his new book, Leading from Anywhere, how he managed to write and publish this book fully remote and at record speed, and what mindset we need to lead successfully in uncertain times. If you like the show, subscribe on YouTube, Revit on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Stitcher, Spotify, Simplecast, or any other platform you use for podcasting. You can also take the next step and get involved in our growing community activities. To do so, you can support the creator's work on Patreon and get to hear episodes in advance, join exclusive live sessions, and help us select guests and topics. You can also engage with our community on Discord. All the links you can find below in the description. A quick mention of our sponsor, FlashUp. Build your virtual team systematically and methodically. Scale with your business at any time and make work better. You want to expand the, your knowledge of how virtual teams work and learn how to build your own team? Join the next virtual team challenge and get all the tools and frameworks to do so. If you want to learn more about the next challenge, visit flashup.io. So, without further ado, let's dive into episode 31 of The Virtual Frontier. Enjoy the conversation. So, hey, David, welcome to the World of Frontier podcast. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, I, I'm really happy we got the chance to talk to each other. I had you on my schedule like last year in October with, uh, with a different topic um, <laughs> uh, and, and talking more about your book, uh, A Friend of a Friend. Um, and then you came up just in the uh, last couple of months in the pandemic um, with the idea to write a new book. <laughs> And uh, that fits uh, so greatly to our uh, whole story in the Virtual Frontier, where we talk about remote work. And um, your new book uh, is called uh, Leading from Anywhere. So we're going to talk today about that. But um, for the people that uh, maybe don't know, know you yet from more German speaking um, part, um, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit from where you're coming, what, what you're doing, where you're heading? Yeah, yeah. Um, so my name is David Burkus. I'm an organizational psychologist by training. Um, and a writer by passion. I actually was a writer beforehand. I was an undergraduate, as a university student, was an English major, and went to graduate school for organizational psychology. The whole goal um, in my whole career has always been to tell stories that blend uh, what is cutting edge behavioral research and what is good practice inside of organizations to make people uh, have a better experience of work, to make them uh, work on their teams better. I would say to try and help people do their best work ever, but the real sort of um, internal motivation behind all of it is that work is too central to everyone's life not to be terrible, right? It's too big a part. It's 40 plus hours a week of your life. It's where a lot of people draw their identity from. And unfortunately, across the globe, in, in most, especially in the West, but in most industrialized countries, the experience of work is not optimal. It's not something people enjoy, right? There's a reason television shows like The Office are popular across the world, right? And cartoons like Dilbert are, are translated into hundreds of, <laughs> of different languages for people to read and laugh at, like, because it resonates with the crappy experience a lot of people are having. So my life's mission has always been to make that better. And I do that through blending um, some of the best stories that I can find with the most uh, up-to-date and proven, that's another kind of important element, but proven research around behavioral science, around how we form teams, how we're motivated, how we can think more creatively, um, all of that. And so, um, yeah, that, that led to a bunch of different things. But when the pandemic started, that meant that my focus had to move into how do we make the experience of work remotely a lot better for people. It was a, it was a sudden sort of pivot, but you know, the world was ending. So we needed to do something and we needed to do it fast. 
And, and especially, uh, as you just mentioned in the entrance, uh, um, a lot of things in the in the traditional workforce uh, and, and uh, environments and companies w were not optimal. And, and then now shifting not uh, things that are not optimal to a remote uh, could be even more uh, um, even more difficult, right? Yeah, I mean that's exactly right. I mean we had ironically a lot of the the way I describe it a lot of times is that COVID. And the pandemic and our response to the pandemic, none of that really changed things. It just accelerated trends that were already happening. So there was already an increasing demand for people to um, have a sense of autonomy, have a sense of feeling trusted. The more we shifted from industrial work to knowledge work, the more we need to just trust the people we're asking to do tasks that they know how to accomplish them best. And we need to take our sort of surveillance off of them, right? But unfortunately, the other thing that happened is that a lot of people's terrible management got worse as well. A lot of, a lot of bosses out there in the world before the pandemic were still associating presence with productivity, right? They were still assuming that if you're at the office, you're working right? Which is just not true. Ask any uh, information technology department at any major corporation how much time is spent on Facebook and Netflix and YouTube. And you know that just because people are at work, they're not necessarily working, right? And unfortunately, the trend that got worse there is in a remote work environment that turned into endless Zoom meetings that turned into being judged based on how quickly you respond to emails. Um, so bad management got a whole lot worse in, in the in, during this this whole work from home experiment, but the trend towards it, the trend towards giving people the freedom to work from anywhere and good leadership got a whole lot better. And so the place where we're at now, we're recording this early 2021. And my prediction is that by the end of the 2021, you know, it'll be, it'll be safe in quotes um, to go back to the office, but we're not all going back. Not all of us, not all the time, because a lot of people First of all, a lot of people are going to feel safe at the office on a different schedule, but I'm not even talking about that. I just mean a good percentage of people like the freedom that they've been experimenting with over the last year. They liked that they had the opportunity to rebuild their entire schedule and how work integrated with their life. They liked the ability to work undistracted for multiple hours a day. Not everybody was undistracted. We were chatting before this about a uh, little how you deal with the distractions of other people in your home, but other people love it, right? So everybody's a, a little bit different a year in. It took some growing pains, but a decent percentage of people really enjoy where we're at now and they're not going back. And so my message for a lot of people right now is if you're leading a team, you need to be using this time to learn how to lead a remote team. Even if most of your team comes back to the office, the likelihood that your team will always be there and will always be together is slim to nothing moving forward. There will always be somebody choosing to work from some other place, at least one person on your team at different times. And so you got to get ready for that. And you got to pull the lessons of what it means to lead a great remote team from uh, what we know from behavioral science, from companies that have been doing it for a number of years, and then also from what you've been learning over the past year and put that all together and really focus on being a great remote leader at this point because there really isn't any type, any other type of leader, at least in a knowledge work economy. Yeah. And and I could notice I, I was reading like several articles from, from big companies where the CEOs and I, I would won't mention any names right now, but uh, big company uh, owners and, and CEOs were just like saying they are so tired of the, all the Zoom meetings and it's nothing is getting productive and it's not efficient. And uh, when when you look deeper, then you can see as what you just mentioned before that they were just hanging around uh, Zoom meetings all day and and trying to manage uh, uh, their old style with their old style um, of, of managing and getting things remote and that doesn't work really well. Yeah, I mean, that's the grand irony, right? Their, their complaint is that we're spending too much time in Zoom meetings. I don't remember as many people complaining that we were spending too many time in meetings, meetings, right? In person or Zoom meetings, it doesn't matter. Most of your people are spending too much time in meetings. And we know that. We look at the research. We look at whether it's survey research or experimental research. And we know that a lot of the most productive people in organizations really loathed how much time they didn't get to focus on the job that they actually got hired to do the value that they actually created because they were sucked into all of these different meetings, right? And so it, it is a little bit ironic to me to hear people say, oh, I don't really think this is working. I need to see my people, et cetera. Like you don't realize you might have actually been the production blocking problem here, right? You might have actually been the reason they don't want to come back. And, and for the record, I don't think we are, when it's all over, I don't think we're going to be in an environment where a lot of people are 
as remote as they are right now, working the entire week in the office, right? Um, I think it'll be much more like, hey, you can expect to see them two or three days out of the week, and then two or three days they'll work from wherever they want. Or other people will go, well, um, I know we do meetings between 10 and 2, so I'll always be on campus then, right? I'll be in the office then, but I won't I won't be in until 10 because I've got to do you know, get my kids ready for school or I won't be just, uh, they'll be, they'll be blending their work and life a whole lot better. Right. And I and my argument is let them, right. Because we've had a year to experiment. Your top talent has had a year to experiment around and find a rhythm for how to blend work and life in a way that works for them. And not a lot of them are going to want to give it up because a lot of the research suggests it's working really well for them. I, I was talking just yesterday for, for another podcast, uh, which uh, is going to be published in a few days, uh, with a photo, uh, with a person that uh, works in, 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 in the uh, science of future. And uh, he's predicting uh, with, his, with his institute, um, this was more uh, based on, on German uh, data, but I think this is uh, globally more or less uh, going in the same direction. That uh, the the workforce uh, indeed is uh, decreasing, and so on uh, with all the automation and the future AI and everything. You could expect that uh, uh, we're gonna lose uh, work, uh, and and we're gonna maybe there are less work than before. But he predicts uh, the, the complete difference thing um, is telling that in a few years, uh, like employers have to uh, hunt their uh, um, employees uh, and. Uh, and not the other way around that you have to look for jobs. No, they're going to uh, ask you every two weeks with a new headhunter if you probably want to join their great company and so on. Uh, why I'm telling this right now is uh, talking already about culture in the company and how you work with, uh, with your uh, company employees is uh, really crucial because in, in a few years, the top talents, they're going to just say, okay, um, if there's a company where I can work from anywhere, And uh, they, they, the company give me uh, uh, gives me all the, the the things I need to be a great talent and um, uh, yeah, provide excellent work. Then um, the companies who doesn't or uh, the company w w which doesn't apply to that, uh, they're gonna have like really big problems, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the way that I describe it, and this is this has been true historically, and so I think it's right in line with what the uh, futurist was predicting, is that top talent has always needed organizations less, right, than organizations need top talent, right? The power dynamic has always been, as soon as we flipped from an industrial economy to a knowledge work economy, uh, as soon as the decisions that were being made, not the brute force labor that was being executed, as soon as the mental decisions that were being made was what created more value, good decisions were 10 times more valuable than bad decisions, et cetera, or, As soon as those differences started piling up, the power dynamic shifted to talent, and talent has always needed uh, organizations far less than organizations need to find top talent. Um, and flexibility is going to be a huge demand for top talent moving forward. Um, the, the other thing, like you said, the other thing that'll be a big one is culture. We know from several uh, different studies that people will willingly take a job that pays less to work in a company that's known for their company culture, to work around peers that actually exhilarate them and engage them and that sort of thing. And so this isn't just, a, you know, in the, in the, at least in, in the United States in the uh, 1990s uh, and a little, bit, a little bit afterwards, we talked about the war for talent, right? This idea that companies were laying out all of these different things. But we were primarily talking about monetary things to, to compete for the war for talent. We were talking about salaries and benefits and little office perks, right? Um, and not actually paying attention to Uh, the the most important thing, which is that culture, right? A foosball table and a and a keg of beer is not a great company culture. Those are just little perks, right? Company culture is something entirely different, and it takes all. Uh, it's not monetary to sculpt, but it does take a lot of deliberate uh, attention. And ironically, you would think that it's less important in a remote environment, but it actually becomes more important, right? Because it's really really easy to feel like you're out, you're working alone when you're working remotely. And it takes a strong company culture and a strong team to make sure people still feel that sense of engagement with the organization, with the mission, et cetera. Um, and then if you are working on a team to, to collaborate on a project that is bigger than just what you can produce, remote teamwork, collaboration, all of that is more important in a remote environment because you don't have the in-person uh, ability to just walk down the hall and smooth things over or get it, get it figured out right away. You need to be very intentional and very deliberate in your communication. That affects your teamwork. That usually makes for... Uh, for a good company culture. So again, we're at the same situation, right? 
all that's happened over the past year is the same trends have been accelerated. And now the things that we know, like culture, are far more important. How, how you would um, go uh, inside a company that um, was pushed like in the last year uh, into a remote environment, uh, um, maybe not voluntary, um, and they are willing to say, okay, we need to uh, build up a culture that uh, didn't exist before. But what are the first steps going into and, and how, how, how maybe you can advance with that in, in the near future so you get results uh, and, and see a change in, in, in the behavior and in, in, in the company, how they, they act and present themselves? Yeah. So, um, so I look for three things, right? So I look for, and this comes from a fascinating study pre-pandemic, right? BC, before Corona, um, on virtual teams and the team culture of teams that operated well and teams that didn't. And the, the big things that they found, the, the research study I'm referring to found two big things, which was shared understanding and shared identity. And I'll talk about those both in turn, but I pair those with because there's a lot of overlap between that and a study that Google undertook globally, right? So I, li I like this one too, because again, pulls from all different cultures um, and found five different elements. The two from this study and the five from this study overlap, except for a phenomenon known as psychological safety. So when I mix these two studies together, what I arrive at is three things, three easy ways to remember. Three is easier to remember than five, so we'll go with it, right? And that is shared understanding, shared identity, and psychological safety. Um, shared understanding is the level to which everybody on the team understands each other's knowledge, skills, abilities. They know who is talented, where. They also know how to work with that person in their strengths and, and to give that person feedback when they're not in their strengths, to make requests for help. And the big one for going remote, right, is that I understand the context that that person works in. Like I was talking about earlier, we've spent a year building an integration between work and life that is working for most people, but it doesn't look like it used to, you know, pre-pandemic. And I, I, this is an irony, right? Pre-pandemic, before it affected sort of my kids and their school schedules, um, I worked from home before then. But as soon as that happened, my schedule had to be rearranged. And so now, good luck getting a hold of me between the hours of 9 a.m. and noon, my time, right? Because I've got a lot of other things life-wise I need to focus. Then I come back on online and work for a little bit longer, right? So everybody is in that situation. And then also everybody's working in a different physical environment too. You and I, uh, I'm judging by your video, we, we look to be lucky enough to be in our own room where we can close a door and be uninterrupted. And some people are working from the dining room table, right? While their kids are, are playing in the other room or are watching a Zoom video class, right? So shared understanding means all of that because when we understand the context that people are working in, we can collaborate better with them. We have more empathy for them. And that just makes us communicate and collaborate better. Now, shared identity, I, I like to think of shared understanding as the 2020 problem. We all needed to figure out without being able to be co-located, needed to figure out the shared understanding piece, the context piece, the knowledge, skills, and abilities piece. The shared identity, I think, is the 2021 problem, which is that as people start trickling back into an office environment, not everyone's going to want to go. And it can be really easy to think about the people that you see more frequently or the people that occupy the same um, office space with you. Or if you're in a fully distributed company, the people in the same time zones or similar time zones as you, there's always this weird us versus them that can creep up inside of one team where the people who live on one continent feel like they're the real team and the, the them is people on a different continent and those people feel differently, right? And it takes a, a leader to help build up a strong sense of shared identity. We are one team collaborating together. We're working on one purpose, et cetera. It, it takes a strong leader to build that so that people don't feel that intercompetitive rivalry um, in a team. So that's shared identity. Uh, and the last piece is psychological safety. And this is one, this is true actually of any organization. Right? I don't know of a single organization that doesn't need psychological safety as part of their culture. But in a remote organization or a remote team, it again becomes more important because psychological safety is the level of trust and respect that people feel. Do they feel trusted enough that they can take risks, that they can experiment, that they can fail and not be punished so long as there was a learning that came out of that failure? And also, do they feel that they can speak up? Do they feel that they can voice dissent, right? My number one test for psychological safety when I work with team leaders is I say, when was the last time somebody on your team disagreed with you vocally in a, in a team meeting? When was the last time that happened? Was it a couple of days ago? Great. Was it six months ago? We have a problem, 
right? Yeah, um, yeah, because yeah. presumably you're you're hiring the top talent you can find, and you're saying do do your best, right? You you we hired you for these skills and abilities, and here's the things we need you to do. If they don't feel safe enough to speak up, to push back, to do the work the way they want to do it, then you're actually putting a dampener on their potential. And, and we obviously don't want that, right? There's a bunch of other ethical and moral issues that go along with psychological safety, but I'll just, I'll make the straight capitalistic business case, which is that if people don't feel psychological safety, you are not harnessing their full potential and as an employee. So you are losing money because you're paying them a salary and you're not getting the full benefits of that salary. All the more reason to make sure that they feel that sense of psychological safety. Yeah. And just ca catching up with uh, the, the points that you mentioned, um, as well with the understanding uh, part, um, like my full respect to all the parents out there that were working this year uh, with like the kids in the kitchen and dining room and the, or in the living room, having them like shared devices and whatever. Um, yeah, we can feel really fortunate uh, that, that uh, yeah, we work in, in, in Good space and and um, yeah, a lot of lot of parents uh, and and um, people that work employees are struggling with them that and uh, just um, yeah keep keep improving like little by little your workspace I, I could mention on that and um, w what you said about the psychological uh, safety in in the work environment uh, is also very interesting um, from our own uh, his, um, history in uh, Flash Up and Bright Solutions um, where we had this transition from. Uh, a hybrid company more or less uh, where we had our head offices and uh, uh, there were like 40 people working in the office and uh, a huge chunk of uh, project workers and freelancers outside and we had an <clears throat> this also in the beginning in the first couple of months or year um, where, where there was this feeling of, of, of feeling different right and and uh, like um, having not the same access to information maybe. And this is uh, also a process no, that, that you have to take in account. This is nothing that is going to disappear from one day to another. Um, you just have to keep improving uh, day by day and, and uh, um, decreasing this, those uh, um, inequalities, let's say, uh, in general, right? And, and yeah. getting like everything more included. And I think one, one big step uh, that happened there uh, where was when our CEO <clears throat> took the decision to say, okay, I'm going to work remotely full time and I'm not going to be in the, in the head office anymore uh, just for maybe some legal stuff. And then uh, a couple of months uh, later, um, this uh, got a, yeah, a huge improvement. And um, science, since the pandemic started, uh, we actually don't have any more people working in the office, just like going for um, some uh, inavoidable uh, things or legal stuff that they have to do in the, uh, in the offices. But in general, everyone is working right now. Last year, also the the, of, um, the employees in the, in the inside the company, um, everyone is working remote, and this was also a huge shift again. And so, uh, what I want to point out is this iterations you have to go for uh, and and keep keep improving that one one by one. Yeah, I, I, I mean, ironically, if, if I could, if we could go back and not have this sudden pandemic that forced the what I jokingly call the great work from home experiment, I would have preferred a slower rollout experiment. Like I really like the way that you, the process you just described. The interesting thing is that now we have to do that process in reverse, right? Now, every in the knowledge work organizations, I mean, there's still a huge percentage of the workforce that has been working in person all the time beyond just essential workers, right? Um, but for in the office environments that we're talking about that have been remote for a year, our, our slow phase transition is actually happening in reverse, right? Feeling out who wants to come back to the office. Um, and that's what I fear is that because we're working in the in the reverse, we're almost going to start looking at the people who come back to the office um, as as the ones who are. That's the goal, right? And it shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be, and, I, and I'm not talking about your organization, right? I just mean in general with all different organizations. The goal should be to to let people feel that the office is a space where everyone is welcome and everyone has a place, but no one feels obligated, right? Um, that it's a space where if you feel like you need in-person collaboration, yes, there's legal um, situations where you'd want to have certain things done in person, et cetera. Um, but it, let's just say you want a space to collaborate. We have one for you, right? Let's just say you have a, 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 a office or home environment where you would rather escape from and go somewhere to get work done just so that you don't have to be doing it alongside everybody, right? Great. We'll have the space for you. And that may not be a corporate office that may be that we pay a WeWork membership for you or some other co-working space membership for you, right? 
Um, but that's, that's sort of my goal in working with organizations is as we experiment back, don't think that the goal is to slowly bring everyone back because everyone's not coming back. The goal is to create a space where everyone feels welcomed and no one feels obligated. Yeah, just more. I, I imagine that in the few, near future, there's like co-working spaces. One one option. Uh, I see the the future of the office more like a lounge club uh, idea where you just go uh, some days per week and uh, enjoy the time where you spend there. Get some uh, things that you might don't have in in your in your uh, home office um, from where uh, you work. Um, but in general, I I completely agree with you um, that the, the culture should go there um, to enable people to work literally from anywhere they really like. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think the investments, you know, I don't think everybody's going to give up their home office or I'm sorry, their their corporate office space. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of real estate investments that need to be made transforming those office spaces. We need a lot less desks and a lot more meeting rooms. We need a lot, we need a lot less coffee makers and perks and, and little coffee shops and, uh, and gyms in the, in the first floor of the office suite and that sort of stuff and a lot more technology, right? So there's a lot of changes that are going to be made to that physical space. Um, and, and, you know, and that's good, right? Because that will encourage some people to be there a bit more often. And there are certain scenarios, you know, I'm still, there's a whole chapter in the book around how do you create a problem solve remotely? Cause that's the number one, that's not the number one complaint that I get, but it's the number one complaint that I get that I go, yeah, you're probably right there. This is better in person, but we'll, we'll deal with what we can. And so we're going to need to be making a lot of, a lot of collaborative technology in, investments and that sort of thing. So. A lot less desks, a lot less, me a lot more meeting rooms, right? A lot less copy machines, a lot more webcams. Well, what uh, idea do you have um, for departments that are working cross-functionally? Because in, in the culture wise, I, I'm, I, I would like to get your idea on that. Um, Let's talk about our own marketing department, uh, which I'm working with. Um, there we have a little, uh, really good understanding what, what is happening. Everyone is really engaged and, and, um, we, we are, uh, working good together. But how you build those, uh, cultures between different departments, let's say then, uh, software development, right? Which I, I'm not working really closely, but, uh, I, I would like to get, uh, better connections in, inside those, uh, teams. So that the um, bonding between those teams and, and so on, the company is getting stronger. Do you have any ideas on that? Yeah. So, so um, one of the things that I, I found before, I'll, I'll, I'll share a less sort of organizational structure way and then I'll share a larger way. Um, but one of the things I found that a lot of fully distributed companies were doing pre-pandemic that was very quickly adopted by a lot of other companies um, was the concept that they use, a lot of them use the Swedish word fika, right? Which is just coffee and, and cake, right? It's the idea of going out for coffee with somebody or, or getting a beer with somebody, but you can do it in the middle of the day instead of the end of the day, right? Um, and so what they would do is basically have these virtual 30 minute connection meetings with people. Just usually they started doing them with our team, right? So Daniel and I haven't talked in a while, just about nothing, right? The idea is to have this non-work conversation that lets us build bonds, And a lot of companies that, that had started that at the team level found that the most successful way to implement it was actually to do it cross-functionally so that you were building that connection to um, software. Because if you're waiting for a project to be the reason that you're building that connection to a person, that may or may never come up, right? But if you're, if you're saying we have a company-wide um, practice of doing this, do you want in and you'll be exposed to a diverse set of people, et cetera, then you're much more likely to make those connections. And, th and this, by the way, aligns with a lot of research that I talked about in Friend of a Friend. Um, there was a great study about, uh, they called them the organizational misfits, the people who would join like a large organization and would actually bounce around inside departments and not really find a, a specific leg of the corporate ladder to climb up. They would just sort of bounce around laterally for a while. But then whenever they did get settled in a department, let's say marketing, they shot up the corporate ladder a lot faster because they had connections to everybody, right? So this FICA idea, it's a really cool, not, it, doesn't, it doesn't require any changes to the org chart or any changes to anything other than letting people opt in to get paired up with people to have these get to know you conversations with. So I'm a big fan of that. And there's other ways you could do it too. You could do it with multiple people, not just one-on-one. -on -one. You can do a bunch of, of other things. I don't think it's the zoom happy hour thing where we all just gather and bring your own drink and we just sort of hang out i think everybody's a little hungover from the zoom happy hours um but there is a, so there's a structure to it right that the point is to have these exploratory conversations where we get to know people etc you can even seed them with specific questions to ask and all that so that's my unofficial way 
the official way, I think, cross, cross-functional teams, matrixed organizations, all of that sort of stuff, um, I think we're a little too attached to the org chart. And that creates a big problem, right? I think most, and I wrote about this actually five years ago in Under New Management, most organizations think of the job still as the building block of the organization instead of the project. And what I see when I look at especially resilient organizations, organizations that handled the pandemic, but also organizations that handled all sorts of economic downturns, et cetera, what they would do more often is look at hiring, like building a portfolio of talent. And then when a client project would come in, they would go to the portfolio and go, who do we have whose knowledge, skills, and abilities match this project? And you could end up serving on uh, three or four different projects. That doesn't mean you have three or four different bosses, which is what we did when we went from single hierarchy to matrixed organizations. Everybody just felt like they answered to five or six different bosses. It's the understanding that you're actually an internal freelancer and one team is using 30% of your time and another is 40%, et cetera. And you have multiple different customers. And then there's team leaders whose job is to lead the project, but you don't necessarily have that sort of formal command and control hierarchy, right? I called this, in under management, I called this writing the org chart in pencil. And I think it's a structure that a lot more organizations in this remote world need to play with. And we're already seeing it. We're seeing it done internally, but we're seeing um, massive increases in tools or, or, or services like Upwork, for example, which allow you to, it, Upwork used to be I used to think of it as like Fiverr, right? I need a logo design for my coffee shop. So I go to, to o, o, Odesk, right? Or Elance. Uh, now they've merged and they're going after corporate clients. And they're saying, do you need a team of 20 coders? Do you need a, a financial analyst team to, to audit? your are like, we have those. You can hire just the team. So we're going to see this mix of internal and external teams all coming together. The building block of organizations is going to be the project. We might as well start thinking of it that way instead of thinking of the building block as the job. Right. Um, it, when working in those uh, teams, when, when you, for example, let's pick up uh, developers or, or um, software projects, uh, digital, digital project, whatever, uh, with whatever background, um, you have always like this creati creative part in, in, included. And a lot of uh, um, people or managers think um, creativity can be done in, in a remote environment? Or what do you respond to those people? Yeah, well, um, they're right in some capacity, right? Uh, I mean, if we define creativity as the act of brainstorming, right, getting people together and generating a lot of ideas, uh, there are not, we don't have the collaborative technologies that I think can replicate an in-person ideation session. Uh, but the other thing I would tell them is that's not the entire process of solving a problem, right? Creative pro creativity is a process. Innovation is a process. Problem solving is a process. And unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, people assume that we have a problem. They assume that they knew the problem, which is a dangerous assumption, right? And then they would call a meeting, get everybody together and just start generating ideas. And yeah, I don't, I don't have a tool, a hack and anything that'll be better than that. Um, but That's not the right way to do it anyway. What we should have been doing is, oh, we have a problem. Let's spend some time going backwards, researching it. Make sure we understand what's the actual root cause. Organizations, uh, and this is true of for-profits, non-profits, governments, etc. cetera, uh, organizations and bureaucracies are famous for trying to cure symptoms instead of treat diseases. And so the first thing we need to do is step back and do some research. And that can be done collaboratively. That can also be done individually, which is, again, what we um, can leverage in a remote work environment. So that's like phase one. And that might mean you're doing a meeting. In the book, I talk about how you should have a minimum of three meetings. One of them is the problem meeting. But there's even phases before the problem meeting where your people are just doing research. And the point of the problem meeting is to come together and go, here's what we discovered as we looked into the problem. And at the end of that meeting, you arrive at we know what the actual problem is. And you arrive at the statement of, you know, how, how might we resolve this issue, right? And then you can head into the second meeting, the brainstorming meeting. Ideally, like I said, by the end of, hopefully by the end of 2021, this is something that we can get back to doing in person a lot because I, I do think they're right. I think this phase of the meeting works better um, in person, but we'll do the best we can, right? And that means that we have, in my opinion, that means that we have a video chat going on. And we also on the same screen have a collaborative whiteboard style document that can be a fancy app. Like there's a lot like Bluescape and Miro and a couple of other technologies that are really great from that. 
It can also be a Google Doc. I don't care, right? <laughs> but what it needs to be is something that everyone has access to edit and everyone can see changes to in real time. So we're replicating both elements, the in-person discussion and the way to capture ideas in that ideation session. And again, the point of that meeting is not to make a decision either, just like it isn't to find the problem. The point of that meeting is just to generate ideas. One of the other big problems with assuming that creativity is just a brainstorming meeting is that about 30 minutes in, give or take 10 minutes, people start trying to get to consensus. And we don't need them to get to consensus. We especially don't need them to get to consensus around a bad idea, right? But if we start a meeting and we know that we're just going to generate ideas for 45 minutes or so, and then uh, a different team or maybe the same team is going to come back a little bit later and look at those ideas again, unemotionally, unattached to who generated what idea, et cetera, and make a decision, it usually works better. So then there's that third meeting, uh, the decision meeting, where we're actually going to look at all of the ideas that were generated ahead of time, compare them to the problem statement and all, everything we know about the issue that we generated in the problem meeting, and then we can make a decision. So uh, to what the, that was a really long way of saying, what would I say to that person? I would say that they're right, that that middle meeting is not better remotely but remotely provides them a much better opportunity to hold all three meetings in the proper sequence and end up arriving at a better solution, even though it felt weirder and different and it felt like you weren't generating as many ideas, you're probably going to end up implementing a better idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, where do you see uh, like the... the how you, how i say that um when you when you work uh in in the remote environment and you have like um this creative processes um where do you see the, the advantage in getting things done uh, asynchronous in 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 reverse to to having like that uh, what you just mentioned uh getting after um 20 30 minutes of uh, brainstorming already to conclusions and uh, um uh, trying to see, uh, bring things forward. But uh, is there anything else you, you would uh, mention now? Yeah, yeah. So my, my personal opinion, which is driven by the data, but also has to fill in some gaps in the data, right? Um, is that you can have a better uh, ideation or brainstorming meeting if people are doing work asynchronously ahead of time and you can steer that meeting into being discussion about people presenting their ideas. But that only really works in a team culture that especially has psychological safety, um, but a team culture that's already clicking, that already has shared understanding and shared identity, right? Because what tends to happen when you ask people to prepare their ideas ahead of time and you focus the in-person synchronous meeting on um, discussing those ideas is the collisions and the friction and all sorts of great stuff happens as brains conspire together and make everybody's ideas better. It's, a, it's an amazing thing when it's well facilitated. When it's not, what happens is that three or four of the strongest personalities in the team start dominating and start making the case for why their idea is the best one. And the meeker, uh, possibly folks you know, from marginalized communities, et cetera, end up self-censoring and holding back. Or they think their idea is too similar to one that so-and-so already said, and so they self-censor. And we don't, you know, we don't want that, right? So it really depends on where, where you think your team is. If you think you've got that level of psychological safety, right, then yeah, try it. End the problem. Schedule the problem meeting days before you're going to schedule the um, idea or brainstorming meeting so that you can send the problem sketch to everybody, the brief, right? Here's our problem statement. Here's the background on it, et cetera. I'd love for you to come to the meeting ahead of time with three or four ideas to discuss. That can work great in the right culture. But if you feel like that's not your culture, if you're still working on that shared identity, shared understanding, psychological safety thing, I wouldn't necessarily do that because you're going to end up having people self-censor and not actually present everything that's on their list. And that's a problem as well. So yeah, and as I said, that's, that's based on the data. There are studies that really do suggest that people generate better ideas when they do them in isolation and then we add them all up. The problem is those studies are always done in a lab where the researcher gets to read every idea. And my experience has been working with a lot of teams is that that self-censorship piece actually puts, it, puts us backwards compared to doing everything in the room at the same time. I think it, uh, 
for in my own experience, I I love it also to to have like this time to think about really about the problem and then put it together and then present it more or less over uh, to the to the team uh, and and then uh, start to cus- uh, discussing that with um, yeah different team members and and getting them to the best solution. Um, in, in general, I think uh, it's it's important to to get. Um, rid of the, a lot of the hierarchy we already talked about that and and, and structure in, in general and the planning and really try to be uh, like solution focused um, where where we get the best solution out uh, of the problem how we could uh, 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 tackle a different uh, situation or difficult situation and then uh, uh, work really on the on the solution side of the of the problem yeah yeah i agree yeah um I would like to go back a little bit uh, w- w- um, uh, to the beginning of our discussions uh, because um, you you wrote this uh, a new book uh, le- leading from er- anywhere uh, during the pandemic uh, in in a v- really short time and I, I really want to get to this uh, <laughs> this story a little bit uh, if you could explain how did how did it evolved and in in you I did uh, in our teaser for the virtual frontier. Um, like the announcement that you li- really are a record speed uh, uh, author. <laughs> and uh, I would like to get a little bit the story about that and especially also the, the remote parts of this uh, story um, that, that you have uh, written in the last uh, couple of months. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if we set a world record for the fastest time from idea to print in, in a book, uh, but I'll bet you we came close. Um, so, I mean, the, the way it all works, so I started 2020 with um, a project with Audible, actually. So I started this audio book um, called Pick a Fight, which was all about how you inspire and motivate a team, not by picking fights against competitors, but by elevating the fight to something larger, a bigger cause, a bigger purpose, an injustice in the world that needs to be removed. And I thought I was going to spend the next three or four years of my life talking about just that idea. Right. And then, of course, the world ended. Right. Um, so <laughs> this virus spreads across, everything shut down. And um, it was, it was an interesting, interesting attempt. I mean, I learned one thing really quickly, which is that um, when you're betting on audiobook only because the world is going to be commuting uh, all the time and that's how they consume books now, and then the world ends and everybody works from home, your sales plummet, right? And I'm sure you saw it with the podcast as well. Like people just stopped downloading for like eight weeks because they weren't traveling anywhere. So why download the next episode of the podcast? Um, gradually, that's, that's picked up, which has been great to see. But one of the weird things that happened was in, in May, um, my publisher of Friend of a Friend and Under New Management, the two books before that, um, they, they emailed me out of the blue and they said, we were talking about everything. We as a company have been having to work remotely for two months now. And we were talking about how this is, looks like it's going to be a long-term trend, et cetera. And we'd love to, to get something out there in a book about how, how people can cope with this. And we started, we started kicking around ideas of companies that we could maybe reach out to. And then Rick was the name of my editor for a long time. He's now retired, but Rick spoke up. And realize, and he said, well, you know, Dave Burkus has already interviewed most of those companies we just mentioned for his book under new management, right? Maybe we should email him. So I got this email out of the blue that was like, would you be interested in this project? And um, I spent the weekend to think about it. And I, and I actually came back to them and I said, no, but yes, because I said, what, what I don't think the world needs is another book about how to run an entirely distributed company. I think there, there are going to be more of those than there ever were, but it's not going to be most people. What I think the world needs is a book written for somebody a little bit lower, not the senior level of the organization, but that middle manager who is, I didn't make the decision to go remote, but now we're remote, right? Or or, or our company has been gradually moving towards it and I want to be prepared. Or, and this is where leading from anywhere came from, or I realize that the future of work is working from anywhere. And so I want to be prepared to lead that team, right? I said, I'd be interested in writing that book. So they said, yes. And on June 2nd, of 2020, we signed a contract with a a manuscript deadline of July 31st. So had eight weeks to write the book. Um, So I didn't like people asked me how my summer was. And I told them, I don't know. Like that was my response. How was your summer? I don't know. I'm sure it was great, but I wasn't a part of it. Um, And I mean, we're lucky in the sense that a lot of the companies that we wanted to profile and share the stories of, I already had relationships with and that sort of thing. And I was already fairly familiar with the um, with the data, but there were also areas we really needed to explore and learn a ton about, creative problem solving in a virtual environment being one of them, for example. 
Um, but we wrote the whole book July 31st. Then, then we did our own remote team experiment because the publisher is based in New York City uh, and the marketing team was still living there. My editor had chosen to, to flee the city when Corona was running rampant and she was living in California. I was living in the middle of the country, right? Um, coordinating with just people all over the world to bring this project together. Um, and somehow we did. So I, I submitted to them a manuscript on July 31st. We, we spent the month of August editing it. We sent it off to the printer and asked if they could get it done by the end of the year. They printed up copies by the end of the year. I got my first copies in my hand, like late December, just before Christmas. It was a really cool Christmas present. And then it launched on January 5th. So from, from idea or contract, I should say, to publication was six, six months and three days. Um, which is insane. That's one quarter of the time that it normally takes to collaborate with a publisher, come up with an idea, research the idea, write the book, do all the editing, get it printed, et cetera. It's normally about a two year process. And this whole thing was exactly. in six months. So, and, yeah. And, and, and mo mostly the, the editors are, are really not known for, for being like the fast uh, working uh, environments. They, they probably take the two years. Uh, and when you, uh, Yeah, publish your book most well or a lot of things uh, maybe already outdated or uh, you just would have to get yeah. uh, back back to them right and uh, now you have like this is almost like like a live version of what what happened uh, like a couple of months ago yeah no i agree so so normally when you work especially with a traditional publisher um you send them a proposal you don't send them a book you say here's the book i want to write are you interested and they, and it's almost like a business plan and you take it to a, a venture capital firm right and they go yeah we're interested and they sign on um, and they give you an advance and they tell you and have the manuscript by and then as you're writing it what normally happens is when you finish the first two or three chapters like as, as you finish the chapter you send it to the editor but two or three chapters in once the editor has a sense of your style and you've talked about these chapters enough he or she just sort of disappears, right? And says, okay, send the rest to me when you're all done. And then you're out on your own for like six months writing a book. And then you send the whole manuscript back to them. And then you got to go back and forth through edits. Well, we had to do this at, at a much faster pace. So I, I did about a chapter every four days and I would send it to Olivia. Olivia is the name of the person that edited this book. She's brilliant. It was mostly her idea. <clears throat> um, she talked me into it and I said, yeah, you're probably right. This is where the future of work is going. So let's get prepared. Um, and I would send it to her, like I would spend Monday through Thursday writing a chapter and I would send it to her Friday morning. And then I would start thinking about the next chapter so that I could write it on Monday. Um, uh, but by like Tuesday of the following week, she'd have edits back. Right. So we were just in this constant, like I'll be writing a chapter, she'll be editing it. And then we'd flip and I would respond to her comments while she's editing the next chapter I wrote and we'd flip. And it was just this, it was a crazy rhythm that we had to get into because we had, Not only did I submit a manuscript on July 31st, she had edited, at least on the first draft of editing, every chapter before July 31st. So the only editing we had to do in August was copy editing, fact checking, all of that sort of stuff. I mean, this is, this is so interesting because you wrote a book about leading from anywhere, experimenting in the same time in the, remo in, in the remote environment uh, in getting things done, uh, which would take with a traditional editor maybe two years uh, in six months uh, with this uh, special focus on, on getting things done, right? Yeah. Like, uh, there, was, yeah. there was this like deadline. And, and, and I think the big advantage when I see this right from outside is that, that your editors and all the people are, uh, that are, were involved uh, were in the, same, uh, in the same situation as you, right? That's where yeah. when, when the whole story started with the editor and saying oh, maybe you should write a book about that uh, because we are right now in the same situation uh, and uh, uh, I think this would, was a great chance uh, um, also for you how, how did it uh, last year changed uh, your your um yeah, your way of work and and probably like also the 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 writing uh, as you have like written several books uh, and it is it will this affect how you work in the in the future with uh, writing books yeah i mean it it will and it won't i think so to be candid i mean the 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 life of a writer is a remote job mostly right uh, um uh, like i don't i i didn't write other books from a cubicle at the publisher's office right i did it out of my house i've been i've been i was a professor before i was a full-time writer and um so i had an office at one point but i was never there but since about 2016 I've been working from home most of my time, collaborating remotely with project teams around publishing different books, right? The hard part here was that I had to teach them 
how to do it, right? So I'm writing a book about how we do this while teaching the very team that I'm working on <laughs> how to do this because I'm, what I'm used to is being the only person remote and they're all in the same office in New York City together, right? So that was a little interesting. So I am, um, I, I would say I'm less curious in how I was affected and what changed for me than I am in what happens in publishing, right? Because they now know how to do it remotely. And publishers are a weird bunch, at least in the United States. Um, all of them clamor for a very similar location in New York City, crazy expensive office space, right? It's a very sort of I don't, uh, pride-driven business in traditional publishing. And now mm. you don't need that office space, right? Now there is literally no reason to pay that exorbitant rent to have a uh, office space on Fifth Avenue in New York City. So I'm going to be really interested to see. I don't know. I'll tell you in the next book because hopefully it'll end up being with the same team, and the same publisher, and we'll see how many of them have gone back to the office and how many have not. But I'm willing to bet a lot of them have not. Yeah. Um, great point uh, to catch up for me. What What is your outlook, David, to things uh, to to wrap up things for for our conversation today? Um, your outlook for for twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two, maybe. Uh, what should stay and what uh, we should my uh, my change over the time, or where where you see uh, what, what you see coming? Yeah. So I think um, I think meeting in person matters, and it matters more than it ever has, and I think it matters. A, it, it'll be huge when we can do it safely. And I don't know if that'll be fall 2021, spring 2022. Uh, I'm, I'm, it seems like everybody has negative news about vaccine rollouts in different countries, which I don't understand because my wife works in medicine. The idea that we had a vaccine within a year is insane. Can we still just celebrate that? Right. Right. And that leaves me optimistic to say that I don't know if it'll be fall 2021 or, or spring 2022. Um, but those meetups will matter. And so if I were if I were advising any sort of organization, what I would say is recognize that the 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 false equivalence between presence and productivity on a day to day basis has been disproven by the last year. But the importance of bonding people together in person has been strengthened all the more so. So start using some of the money that you're saving on having less office space to plan situations where those remote teams can get together in person again um, for deep bonding experiences, right? Increase your budget for people to go to conferences and, and collaborate and network, et cetera. Increase your budget for company all hands meetings and decrease your budget for office space and focus on making that a collaborative place because meetups do matter um, but people are going to be working from anywhere. The future of work is people wanting to work from anywhere. And part of uh, leading them from anywhere is knowing when that means in person and when it doesn't. And it's going to mean in person in a different way than it ever has before and a better way than it ever has before. Hey David, thank you very much for the conversation today with you. Um, it was a real pleasure talking and uh, getting a lot of new insights and perspectives, uh, exactly what we want to get for our listeners. And, um, yeah, have a great day. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was always, always fun to chat. Thanks for your email. You I mean, you emailed me out of the blue with like an, oh my gosh, you have a new book. That means we need to chat again. And I was yes. like, yeah, I loved it the first time. Let's do it again. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, let's do it when, you, uh, when your next book is coming out. Ah, well, that'll be after a very long nap after the pace that we had to do in yes. this one, but for sure, for sure. Take your time. Take your time. You're welcome. <laughs> always. <laughs> Okay, see you. Yeah, so see you. Thank you. I want to thank our guest David Burkes for joining us today. You can learn more about David, his writings and courses visiting his website davidburkes.com or follow him on LinkedIn. And you should definitely get a copy of his new book, Leading from Anywhere. You can subscribe to The Virtual Frontier on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube or wherever podcasts can be found. And while you are there, you can leave us a review. These reviews help others to find our podcast. Please support us on Patreon so we can keep improving the show and your experience. On behalf of the team here at the Virtual Frontier, I want to say thank you for listening. So until next episode, keep exploring new frontiers. Mm -hmm.